This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. As you look around, it's chilling to see how much of the origins of America have been forgotten or intentionally ignored. This week, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, it's important that we remember our great godly heritage. It was the passion of my dad, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, for Americans to know the truth about the Christian settling and founding of this nation. The facts are undeniable, and yet in recent years, revisionist historians have tried to deny the truth. On today's program, we'll shine a light on America's true history. We'll also take a fascinating look at the Pilgrims' brief experiment with socialism and what it can teach us today. And later, we'll share a classic resource to help you share the truth with others about America's Christian heritage. And I'm John Sorensen. I'll be back later in the program to personally introduce you to the one who was the most important in the settling of our nation. As we begin this Thanksgiving week, I'm excited to present to you a special message from my father, one that hasn't been broadcast on television in many years. This message was delivered in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in front of the National Monument to the Forefathers, where Dad was invited to be the featured speaker for the 100th anniversary celebration in 1989. This magnificent monument was later featured in the Kirk Cameron film, Monumental. This is the classic message, The Pilgrim Legacy. In the name of God, amen. Thus began the compact sign in the captain's quarters on the Mayflower as it stood at anchor off Provincetown Bay, off in the bay. In the name of God begins the birth certificate of America as it is called. In the name of God, amen, began the dedicatory address of William Breckinridge for this monument 100 years ago. In the name of God begins our search this day for the meaning of this monument, more importantly, for the meaning of the pilgrims whose honor this was built to celebrate. In the name of God is where America began. And I trust that today that though they have been long dead, they may still speak to us, and that we might learn something of those grand ideals, those spiritual truths that so gripped their lives and so changed the world. The predominant, preeminent, overarching statue behind us, of course, is the great figure of faith. And it was faith that animated the pilgrims. It was their faith in the living God that caused them to be willing to give up their homes, to give up their native land, to sail to Holland and to live in the midst of people whose tongue they could not understand, where they had no skills that enabled them to accept anything but the most menial jobs in most cases, and where they endured in that wilderness as it was called a moment ago, very aptly, for 12 years. It was their faith that gave them courage to set sail in that Mayflower. I'm sure most all of you have been on it. And I, for one, want to say that 10 minutes in that hold was quite enough for me. And as I recall that they were in that for nine months, I am astonished at the stalwart souls that brought this nation forth so long ago. It was their faith that strengthened them. They, of course, have been called, and rightly so, the people of a book, the people of the book, the Holy Scriptures, 
the scriptures which had been translated for the first time in recent years and is now, was now being brought surreptitiously and illegally into England and which these pilgrims at Scrooby and the surrounding towns had found and discovered and read for themselves and they had discovered the incredible grace of God. They had learned of the gracious Savior who offered them freely the gift of eternal life if they would but trust in him. And trust they did, and their hearts were lifted upward, and they placed their hopes in that one who had loved them and died for them and risen again. And so, properly so, the statue has its finger lifted to heaven. And that, I think, is a very good definition of faith. One has said that faith is simply pointing away from ourselves unto God, unto the living God in Jesus Christ. And for a Christian, that is what his faith is. And that was their faith. They had learned to not trust in themselves. They had learned the great hope of trusting in the Savior who had loved them. I'm very grateful to the Pilgrim Society, which is trying to maintain the real spiritual message of the forefathers. In the Mayflower Compact, they said that they had undertaken this journey to the northern parts of Virginia for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. That was their great desire, to bring the gospel, the Christian faith, to those that dwelt in darkness here on this continent. And that was what animated their hearts and gave purpose to their lives and what sustained them through those long, dreary, dismal days at sea when they weren't even able to go up on deck but were crowded below in a very tight area. It was their faith, and I'm afraid today that that faith has grown weak in a great many Americans. John Quincy Adams said that the highest glory of the American Revolution was that it bound together in one indissoluble bond the principles of Christianity and the principles of civil government. So said President John Quincy Adams. But today we live in a time when faith is indeed being dispelled and driven from the public scene. It is to be privatized, and we are told that this is supposed to be a secular and non-spiritual government. That is not the vision that the pilgrims had. They said that they would create various institutions for the ends aforesaid. And what were those? For the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, the honor of king and country. Those were their goals. That's what they lived for, and that's why they came. Seated around the base of the statue, we have four other statues that embody some of the things that were most meaningful to them. I'm going to depart from the usual order and begin where most usually people end, and that is with the Statue to Liberty. There we have what the pilgrims sought, the reason that they left England that which they struggled so far to obtain. Liberty of conscience, religious liberty, and civil liberty as well. And there are those who would like for the American people to believe that religion is the enemy of freedom. Just the opposite is the case, is it not? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. <clears throat> On your right and my left, we see the Statue of Morality, holding, as you've been told already, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue in one hand, and the scroll of the Book of the Revelation in the other, showing that they believe that morality came from the Scriptures, from the old to the new, from the beginning to the end, that ethics derived from religion, and that is a great truth. There has never been an ethical system that was effectual anywhere in the world that was not based upon religion. And they knew that. 
And that's why the Decalogue and the Book of Revelation are in the hands of morality. Now, it's interesting, I think, to remember that it was because of this statue, principally of liberty, that the pilgrims left England. And it was because of this one, principally, that they left Holland. In Holland, they found the liberty to worship as they pleased, what they want, as they wanted, but the morality of the people in Holland at that time was at such a low ebb that they complained about the lasciviousness and immorality of the young people particularly, and how their children were not only losing their Englishness, but they were losing their moralities and were in danger of losing their souls. And that is the reason that they came here. They wanted to have a free church in a godly society which was based upon morals derived from the Ten Commandments. And that brings us to the statue back farther to your right and my left, which is the great statue of law. And you will notice also that they believe that law was based upon morality, and we've seen that morality is based upon the scripture. So here you have the three-tiered cake of religion, morality, and law. And one is based upon the other and cannot be any other way. And that's what they knew. And so the laws that they framed, which were good and wholesome laws, they say were good and wholesome just to that extent that they were based upon that great and ancient platform of God's holy law. Again, we have found, forgotten that today. We live in a time when there is a great struggle which is really going on for the soul of America. A nation that was based upon Christian principles and Christian morality. Today we find a secular religion, a religion of man, a religion of humanism, a religion of atheism, or whatever you would like to call it, which believes that man must save himself and trust in himself, which gives birth to a whole set of new morality, as they call it, which is another name for the old immorality. And from that new morality, they have been busily engaged for the last few decades in enacting laws based upon not the laws of the Bible, but upon the principles of men who want nothing to do with the Bible. That is not the kind of morality that the pilgrims knew or wanted, and certainly is not the kind that will do this country good. And I should remind you that everywhere in the world, when religious liberty has been lost, civil liberty has not remained long after. And therefore, we need to hold firmly to that freedom of religion, which was not freedom from religion, as so many think today. The last statue which is on the back of this great monument is the statue to education. For over 200 years, for 210 years from 1620 to 1830, virtually all of the education in this country was private and religious Christian in nature, with very few exceptions. Now, today, that is becoming increasingly rare. We have seen that prayer has been removed from our schools. We have seen that the reading of the Bible, which had been done for hundreds of years, for 350 years almost, in all of the educational process in America, has been removed. The Supreme Court has required the removal of the Ten Commandments from the walls of our classrooms. By the way, their reason for doing that was lest per adventure, they say this, lest per adventure, the students looking at them from day to day should be moved to keep them. Now, would that not be tragic? We have now spent several trillions of dollars on secular education. Today, we have 26 million Americans who are completely illiterate, another 30 million who are functionally illiterate, and cannot read simple instructions. That is 56 million Americans who cannot do what virtually every American could do 
and the educational system that cost very little back then. It seems to me that perhaps we have been led astray. <laughs> Lastly, and not least, said Governor Bradford, a great hope and inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation, or at least to make some way thereunto, for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world, yea, though they should be but stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. They had found in their own souls the glorious glad tidings of life eternal, of forgiveness, the assurance of everlasting paradise, meaning and purpose for their lives here before, and they wanted to share that good news with others. And may we, their descendants, the inheritors of their great legacy, may we this day rededicate ourselves to those spiritual and godly ideals that this country might indeed become a nation set on a hill for all the world to see, to admire, and to emulate. Thank you, and God bless you. Friend, as we approach Thanksgiving, I hope that one of the things that you're thankful for is the free gift of eternal life that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you remember to thank Him for that gift? I hope so. But you know, you can't be thankful for what you don't have. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life, that you'll spend eternity in heaven with God, and that in the meantime, God, the creator of the universe, is working everything that happens in your life for your good? If you don't, you can. We can go to God together in prayer right now. Simply pray, Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I'm a sinner in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions, and I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me from my sins. I know that you died in my place on the cross and paid the penalty that I owed but could never pay. Please come into my heart. Give me new and right desires that I may live a life that is pleasing to you. In your name I pray, amen. I hope you prayed that prayer and invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you did, we'd like to help you get started in your new life by sending you a book written by Dr. Kennedy called Beginning Again. This will help you grow in your newfound faith. You'll learn how to read and study the Bible, which is essential for every Christian's life. You'll learn how to pray, and very importantly, you'll learn how to bring others to saving faith. To receive Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. God bless you as you do. The pilgrims came to the New World for religious freedom. They wanted the freedom to practice Christianity as they believed the Bible taught, free from the intrusive government church they had back in England. But interestingly, the pilgrims did not immediately see the connection between religious freedom and economic freedom. Yet, as the scriptures say, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The value of economic freedom was a discovery the pilgrims made the hard way, and a lesson we perhaps need to relearn today. Let's take a closer look. In September of 1620, the Pilgrims, a small church of refugees from England who had spent 12 years in Holland, set out for America aboard the Mayflower. Who were these bold and brave individuals, and what were they truly seeking? The word pilgrim actually comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and that was given to the pilgrims after they arrived. The pilgrims weren't called pilgrims when they did arrive. They were called separatists, which was a derogatory term for having separated from the Church of England. They were individuals that had uh, come through what we know as the Protestant Reformation. They were followers of many of the early reformers in the 1500s. 
What they desired was to set up a colony where they could be free to worship and glorify God as they believe He had designed. All they were doing was actually following the teachings that they believed came from the Scriptures and the Reformation regarding covenant itself. Because you have a covenant with God, and then you covenant with one another to crown God the source of your laws. When they had separated from the Church of England, they formed their own co church covenant by their own voices and by their own individual uh, initiation. And so that practice they carried over to the civil realm, and they drew up the Mayflower Compact on board the ship off of Provincetown Harbor in Plymouth. And when they did that, they began it with these words, in the name of God, amen. In fact, they said in this actual document, they came for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And thus the first settling government in New England was formed based on the idea that God is the giver of our individual rights. So this idea that rights come from God to the people and then out to the government is very critical. And because of that, they're unalienable. They come from God, can't be taken away by government, and that government is actually a servant of the people rather than the people being a servant of the government. The colony was governed by William Bradford, a man who knew and believed the scriptures. William Bradford's leadership was imperative because Bradford was the kind of calm governor that would make some very sound decisions. And of course was the individual who wrote the journal and the history of the pilgrims and what we now know as of Plymouth Plantation. William Bradford noticed that when the socialistic principles of collectivism were applied to their colonies, the results were quite negative. Several things he noted were happening. Number one, people were not having any incentive to go to work because no matter how much they worked, they got paid the same because everyone, it was divided equally. And then secondarily, he said wives were getting upset because they're ending up doing laundry for husbands that are not their own husbands and not their own families. Bradford wrote, Seeing all men have this corruption in them, God in His wisdom saw another course fitter for them. Realizing this failing experiment was endangering the new colony, Bradford decided that each family would be apportioned its own piece of land on which to sow and reap. And immediately following that change, they went through five weeks of drought. And they learned another lesson. Even if you have the right system, if you don't trust God for the provision, it won't work. They had a prayer meeting and a prayer and fast day on a Wednesday, praying for rain and then it rained gentle showers. And indeed, when the rain finally came, the change to private farming quickly bore fruit. What did it do? Well, immediately it doubled the amount of land farmed the first year and tripled it the second year. Where before there was lack, the colony started to become productive and prosperous. They then have a day of thanksgiving to give thanks to God for the wisdom to set up the right system of economics and also for the provision that God gave through that system. What made the Pilgrim Thanksgiving so unique was the aspect that this had become something that was a part of their heritage in England. The Pilgrims would have public days of fasting and prayer where you would call upon the name of the Lord, you'd confess your sins, you'd ask Him to be able to uh, bless you in every aspect of life. And then you'd give thanks to God. And this became eventually a springtime annual fast day and a fall annual harvest day. Why? Because in the fall when you had the harvest of crops, you thank God for answering those prayers. So the idea of thanksgiving weaves together several ideas. The idea of giving thanks to God, He is the source of all of our blessings. The idea of being thankful that God is the one that has answered your prayers specifically. It's a time that we unite and celebrate the fact that we've been able to be in covenant with God, in covenant with one another as a church, and reaching out to the community around us that's all embraced in the idea of Thanksgiving. And the lessons we can learn from that are huge. We are to go before God, like the pilgrims did, and thank Him for every provision they've been given, and then ask Him for the endurance necessary to persevere for the future. After that first deadly winter, the pilgrims began to apply the principles of the Bible to their economics, and prosperity followed. Yet, just look at America today. We're still trying to do things without God. Forgetting the lessons of our own past and the lessons of the world around us, we're still attempting to deny God's Word, leading us down a path of sin, secularism, and socialism. There is a concerted effort today to erase God from our history and our national consciousness 
and we're paying a steep price because of that effort. But there's good news. The principles of our founders that made America strong in the past are still available to us, and they can move America from a track of despair and moral decay to prosperity and godliness once more. It has never been more important for America to go back and learn those lessons again. That's why we put together the powerful program, 10 Truths About America's Christian Heritage, available either on DVD or audio CD. This program is hosted by John Rabe and me as we investigate 10 undeniable truths about the Christian history of our nation, truths that are being obscured and forgotten. This program is ideal for homeschool students, Sunday school and Bible study groups, or just to watch for yourself. And for a limited time, we'll send it to you, along with a companion book, 10 Truths About America's Christian Heritage, for a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll free, 888-334-9762, or go online to djameskennedy.org. You'll be informed and encouraged by this powerful resource. Among the truths John and I uncover in this program, some of which may surprise you, are that Christian zeal fueled the American Revolution. America's schools were formed to advance the Christian faith, and the courts have declared we are a Christian nation. Contact us right away for your DVD or audio CD of 10 Truths About America's Christian Heritage, and we'll include the companion book for your generous donation of any amount. Simply write to us at Box 6085, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 888-334-9762, or go online to djameskennedy.org. Perhaps you can give a gift of $30. Some of you can give a gift of $40 or even $100 or more. Any gift you give will be appreciated. And you'll want to share this eye-opening resource with friends and family as well. We need to know what's being lost so that we can go about regaining it. Thank you for joining us. And may you and yours have a blessed and happy Thanksgiving. And may God bless America with a new spiritual awakening. Today's program is available on DVD or audio CD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. Next week on Kennedy Classics. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, and neither were they thankful. And from there, it is all downward. We ought to push back against any encroachment on our liberty so that we have the freedom to share the gospel with as many people as possible for as long as possible. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.